I would add to that I've been watching the White House press corps really closely, and I'm not seeing a whole lot of change in that population. There was a really telling picture in the Washington Post where Barack Obama is surrounded by the press corps, and it, you know, kind of looks like a, a fly in the buttermilk, as they say. Um, you know, this is a really tough issue because in, in tough economic times, these are things that, that I think it's still okay for media executives to say diversity is fine and good and that diverse hiring practices are important when the economy is plush. And I think right now, as people have echoed, that the, um, the consolidation of the industry, the crisis mentality, is allowing people to overlook that. I think one really good example, I would say that it's also an issue of youth, looking at people with a different generational perspective on race, somebody who looks beyond just the black-white paradigm and can look at multiracial as an identity, look at um, the um, emergence of immigrant communities and um, everything from African immigrants to Asian Americans, Latinos, and how they're defining their identities. Um, I don't know how we do that in a crisis environment. One of the stories I think really got missed as we talked about Jeremiah Wright, and this is sort of um, controversial to say, but that for a lot of people, what he said was not a surprise. What he said was not, that was a discussion that certain communities were having in and among themselves. And as we get more into niche media, are those conversations still only happening within those communities? That we sort of understand that the, this anger or these um, perceptions that, that there has been a historical, um, call it a conspiracy, call it oppression, that people are still really pissed off about. And that's not a conversation that we brought out to the mainstream. So how do we find the people who will? Real quick, Clarence, so I can go this. Really, really quick, just segue. You just reminded me of something. As a Chicagoan uh, who had been to Reverend Wright's church back before Reverend Wright was cool, uh, the, uh, the funny thing is that uh, and I think Obama mentioned this in his uh, second, uh, or, 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 no, the, uh, the first autobiography. I think it's wonderful to be able, to, before age 50, to have two memoirs out already. The, the man's really lived. Uh, but uh, uh, when he thought, decided to join Reverend Wright's church, his friends in Chicago, a lot of them urged him not to because it was so bourgeois <laughs> and conservative. <laughs> mm -hmm. So context means everything. And believe me, as one who's been covering Chicago politics since before the Harold Washington campaign, uh, Reverend Wright is a voice of moderation. What's funny is that uh, his, his, his sermon that gets quoted so much was like after 9-11. When everybody was crazy, right? And it was it was a classic prophetic theology kind of of a sermon uh, 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 that that was designed to relieve the tension and to put things into a, a context, a biblical. Context. But the disservice came when there were not those dissenting voices to counterbalance what was being said about Reverend Wright, because they made him out to be a quote kook. Well, and, well, and, this, and he this is, is a longer he story. He is far from, from that. But, you know, if you look at the Bill Moyers show with Reverend Wright, uh, where, they, where they put those sermon sound bites into right. context, that was a great program. And I watched that program, and I thought, oh, the Reverend Wright story is going to change. You know what happened Monday? Reverend Wright was right here at the press right. club. I was well, at the head table with him. And he certainly him, didn't help himself. And he put some more sound bites out that just overwhelmed right. that other story. Yes, sir. So, go ahead. And at the, at the outset of this discussion, you, you talked about uh, the fact that the, we've been having this discussion for uh, over 30 years. Uh, one thing that strikes me about it is the panel is the same kind of panel. Where are the executives? Where are the people that, who you're talking about? I'm one of the few African-American managers in public radio and from commercial radio. Where are the folks? Where are the people on the panel? I'd like uh, My question is, it, Clarence, would you go back to the class? Because there's a journalist class in this country. When you go to the correspondence uh, dinner here, or the White House dinner here, there's Clarence, me, Ed, and the brothers and sisters who are serving at, at, at the bars, and everything else is white. When, when you talk about a journalist class, there's a class of, you said whether it's benign or, 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 or it's an aggressive form of racism. American mainstream media managers are some of the most clueless people on the face of this planet. They talk to each other. They don't live in, in the community. Yesterday, NPR, and I'm with public radio, NPR had a, a story about Eric Holder talking, well, he understands, he's from the hood. I grew up with Eric. We went to Stuyvesant High School, which is a specialized high school in New York City. We lived in East Elmhurst. Back then was not the hood. 
So, and, and, and that kind of ignorance and, and, and putting in the context of what Clarence was saying in terms of class, people in the, in the executive suites have no idea. We just had a conference call of NPR trying to make NPR better and, and the, the programmers and news directors. I was the only African American on that conference call. There were no Latinos, no Asians, no Muslims. No, I mean, it's, it's appalling that we're having this conversation in 2009 and we don't have the people here who are making those decisions to explain why they are. Thank you for that. I would only say, as we go to the next question, that the reality is I think part of the reason that we've been stuck in this for decades now is that we have not understood that really it's not about coming in with your palms up anymore or, or palms together suggesting, please let me on. It really is about, and this is why I hope, as we've talked about upstairs, the changing guard of media as the Internet starts to take over, um, that there will be more of, quote, ownership and the ability to uh, not have to wait for someone to okay it for you. Uh, because otherwise, I, I don't think it's going to change. I, I really don't. I, I don't think that anyone is so altruistic that if you have all the gold, you all of a sudden go, you know what, let me give some of my gold away. I, I just don't believe that that is in the DNA of most people.